now, please welcome to the stage Chief Technology Officer of MuleSoft, Uri Sarit. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Great to be back here in London. And I wanted you to welcome you to MuleSoft Connect 2025. That's not a typo. Up here on the stage, we actually are in 2025. You're back in 2019. And the reason is that I wanted to show you the outcome of a lot of the stuff that you guys are doing today, that by 2025, we've created an incredible step change in what we mean by service, in the world of service. Now, in previous Connect demos, we focused on particular industries, whether it was healthcare or factory automation or retail. But reimagining the notion of serving our customers spans all of these, and that's why I chose this topic. Now, if we're going to go all the way to 2025, it's really important to show you this. But since you've had six years to read it, I'll just skip it. So back in 2019, and the reason, by the way, that I was able to build this in 2019, we actually had all the building blocks to create incredible customer service, right? So we had amazing integration platforms to be able, as you just saw, to pull all of this stuff together. And we had ways of engaging with our customers through voice interfaces, right? You could just talk to something, and it would do something. So we broke down that barrier. And we had machine learning, artificial intelligence systems that allowed you to recognize patterns automatically and turn them into automatic actions without somebody having to manually put all of this stuff together. But it was the companies that figured out how to assemble all these capabilities, often built by others, into ways that actually serve their customers in new ways that ended up being the giants by 2025. And they built out, as we saw before, application networks. Right? They took all these capabilities, many of which they didn't have, and created reusable APIs and figured out how to put them together in agile ways, not glue them together, such that as they learned more and as the industries around them evolved, they could move faster than their competition. But it's not just that they moved faster than the competition. They ended up doing the worst thing you can do to your competitors, which is they raised the bar of their market and they raised the bar of consumer expectations. And they, in doing that, they established three principles by 2025. The first principle is, when you're thinking about service, don't just think about how to service your customer when the problems happen. Think about how to prevent the problems from happening to begin with. In other words, problems will, fix, will seem to just fix themselves, and we'll see an example of that in a moment. The second one is, everybody in your company is in service, and that means an investment in making sure that everybody across the company is working in the service of the customers in very direct ways, not just as a poster on some wall. We'll see that too. And the third is that in the end, service is the product. The service that your customers get, whether it's purchasing time or when they actually get the value, that is the service that the customer is buying from you. OK, now, we're about to go on a trip in order to demonstrate this. This is the demo session. And on this trip, we're going to have a lot of things go wrong. But because we're in the hands of these companies, we're going to see how these companies manage to still manage to uh, to meet our objectives. Because these companies measure themselves by whether we, our custom, their customers, actually meet our objectives. So let's start with our first problem. Our first problem is called a bump in the road. In fact, as you'll see, it's thousands of bumps in the road. And to illustrate that, I need to explain to you a little bit of what my world looks like up here in 2025. Now, in many ways, it's very much like the world in 2019. There's a lot of applications that serve every one of us. There's just a lot more of them, and there's a lot more connections between them. Now, for example, our environments in 2025 are very connected. What do I mean by that? We have a lot of cars. A lot of those cars are now self-driving. A lot of those self-driving cars are talking to each other. They're talking to cloud services. They're even talking to the infrastructure of the cities through which they move. And those connections, of course, between all these things are not hard-coded. They're very agile coded. They're coded in an agile way. And they're constantly improving those connections because they're dynamics. Dynamic. Now, one of the companies, one of the great companies that has risen by 2025 to the forefront is called Motiva. So let me introduce you to Motiva. Motiva is mobility as a service. What that means is they have a very simple mission. 
They will get you from point A to point B, no matter what those points are, whenever you need them, reliably. Number one thing is reliably. You can count on them, and so you just assume that it's always going to work. And of course, they've, by 2025, expanded to quite a bit. So they have drone deliveries, and they have self-driving cars, and they have bike services, and so on. But it's that reliability that they, um, that they focus on. And just by the way, if you're still in 2019, don't Google this. It doesn't yet exist. It will by 2025. OK, now, the customer service is amazing. And I kept saying that you know, it's all about reliability. Now, what does that actually entail? So here's, the, here's the, what happened um, last weekend. So we realized that you know, this next weekend, we as a family um, have an opportunity to get together as a family and take a road trip and go enjoy ourselves. It's a relatively rare occurrence. And so we jumped at that opportunity. And in that road trip, we got to drive along uh, with our Motiva Modus. So, after work, right, it's Friday evening, and we get, we step out, and our Motiva Modus is there, ready to take us for the road trip. In fact, it's always there. It doesn't seem to ever need repairs. Nothing ever seems to go wrong with it, so we just kind of take it for granted. In fact, something was indeed wrong, but something was wrong before that. Motiva was already aware of it. Motiva was already fixing that. So let me explain how that works. So what happened is, on Wednesday, the Motiva control room started to sense a problem. Here's an illustration of the Motiva control room. Motiva control room is usually an empty place, but it's the place where the engineers from Motiva can get together in case there are incidents. On Wednesday afternoon, the alert went off. And so what was this alert that Motiva was already seeing by Wednesday, long before we got to our trip? There was a growing problem. And the problem looked like this. Here's an illustration of the fleet of cars and the pressure sensors that are on those cars. And this is what the Motiva engineers were seeing. So they looked at this and they said, hmm, what's the anomaly? Well, let's first explain what this graph shows. You're seeing from top to bottom the car pressure, the tire pressure on those cars. And from left to right is time. And at the top, you see that thick bar. That means that most cars are operating at standard pressure. And then there's a normal distribution of cars with somewhat low pressure, and their sensors go off, and they go off, and, and they fix, um, and they put more uh, air in their tires. But all of this is being read by machines with anomaly detection. And so on Wednesday, the pattern changed. And it's the anomaly detection that actually alerted us to this. Now, no one tire pressure seems off. But the pattern seems way off, and that's why the alarm went off. So that's the data that the engineers got together and saw. And when they looked at this, they said, you know, this is actually really serious. Why? Because, look, since Wednesday, the roads didn't fix themselves, and the car tires didn't get any stronger. So something is really wrong, and something is wrong with the data. In fact, something is likely wrong with the sensors. And if we've got a whole bunch of faulty sensors out there, that's a real problem, because there's a lot of cars driving around with flat tires without the sensors, and that can lead to accidents, and those are our customers. And so in 2019, that would have mandated a recall and a big announcement and really bad outcomes for both the customers and the company. So this is very, very serious. But what could they possibly do about it? So, that's the thing that has changed in 2025. Now, to explain to you what the engineers can actually do about this, I need to introduce you to my Motiva Modus. So, Motiva Modus, come on up on stage. We've got one here. Here's our Motiva Modus. It's really nice. It's the compact version, a little small for our family. Works really well on the stage. If you can come up here a little bit. Of course, it's self-driving. Turn around. Just show people this amazing thing, MuleSoft branded. And let's have Motiva come over here. And uh, we're going to do something since we're engineers. Stop. As engineers, we want to look inside, right? So let's look inside. Let's take the top off. Let's grab this guy. Let's put him on the dissecting table and see what's going on. Engineers couldn't do this, but we can here on stage. Now, I'm on 2025. This demo was built in 2019. And we needed to use something called Ethernet to connect. That slightly raises the probability that demos work. So I'm going to do whatever I can to raise that probability. And that will allow this to connect to the cloud. All right, so what are we looking at here? 
So of course, this is a connected car. It's self-driving. That's not that interesting. What is interesting is all the data that's coming off of this. So you see here in blue lights, those are velocity sensors. They sense when a magnet goes around. They pick that up. And the data, every time that a magnet goes around, gets sent to this Raspberry Pi. In here, all it does is it counts how long did it take since I last saw the rotation and figure out the speed. Similarly, we have pressure sensors. So the rotation speed and the pressure sensors get put together, and there's not a lot of intelligence on this. It simply pumps them up to the cloud, in fact, specifically to Cloud Hub. And on Cloud Hub, there are two applications, two Mule applications that are running. The first one collects all that data, cleans it up, and sends that on to a second one that actually processes that data, puts it in buckets, understands what it is. It's effectively a process API. And that process API then made available to a, an experienced API that creates a UI. So if we can go up here to the UI, you see the user interface. You see basically a display that the driver would see in their car to indicate the state. If there were a driver, and if there were a dashboard, which there isn't because it's self-driving, so in fact, this is just an illustration of the data that's actually getting into the Motiva cloud. OK, now let's understand this data. So take a look, for example, at the top left. You see the front left tire. And there's actually two graphs going on. There's the pressure, which is at around 30 PSI. That's normal. And there's the speed, which is 0, because nothing is, in fact, moving forward. So let's crank up the speed on this and see what happens. Look at the bottom lines. And let's see if we can register the speed. If the bits are going up, then the speed will go up. Yep, sure enough. All four tires are registering that they're going around, right? So the speed is increased. If we turn off the speed and we wait a moment, you'll see that the speed sensors go down. So establishing that whatever's going on here is exactly the data that's being sent to the cloud. Great. How about the pressure? So we see all the pressures are roughly normal. They're around 30 PSI. And now I'm going to look for my handy dandy stick of reducing pressure. I don't know. Oh, here it is. Here's my pressure reducing stick. And I will poke that into the valve and start to let some air out. And this is the rear right tire. So look at the rear right tire. There it goes. And we're managing to detect that the pressure is low. Great. So this is a fully functioning car. And pressure readings and speed readings going up to the cloud, we can measure that. OK. Now, how does that help the engineers? So they say, OK, we have all this data about the car. We know we can't trust for some of the cars the pressure readings. But one engineer remembers geometry. And she remembers that back in geometry class, the tire that is flat should be spinning faster. Why is that? Let's take a look. Tire that's flat is smaller. Smaller tire to keep up with a big tire has to go around faster. So if the car is driving straight, and the tire that's slightly low on pressure has to go a little bit faster. And that differential speed lets you predict the pressure from the speed. That's the aha moment. So there is maybe something that the engineers can do about this, right? So now they put it up in the simulator and try to figure this out. So the first thing they say is, Motiva, just simulate a car for me. And there it is. It's exactly what we saw before. And then we say, OK, Motiva, simulate for me a deflation after seven seconds. And you see that the pressure, of course, went down, because it's a working virtual pressure sensor. And you see that the speed went up a little bit. And if we put them all together, then it's easier to see that just as the pressure goes down, so the differential speed goes up. So I should be able to predict one from the other. If I have a failed car, where you see that the pressure sensors aren't changing at all, but the speed, the differential speed does go up. That means that I've got a bad pressure sensor. So one, I can predict the bad pressure sensors. Two, I can swap them out, just ignore them, and instead simulate what the pressure should be, derive it from the differential rotation. Sounds like a great theory. Now, I've got a lot of data, though, to back it up. So how do I do that? Remember, I've got data from lots and lots of cars. When you filter it just to do the ones that have working pressure sensors, I can figure out the correlation between them. So I take a lot of data, and I run it through millions of cars, and I put it all together, and I come back with a very predictive machine learning model that lets me predict the pressure from the differential speed, even if the car is turning around and so on. And so I take that model, and I deploy it to a few good cars. And I figure out whether the virtual pressure sensors and the real pressure sensors are aligned. And when that happens, they can then deploy it to the entire fleet. So now the entire fleet has 
virtual pressure sensors for the ones that have broken pressure sensors and the real pressure sensors as well. And when they look at that distribution, now it looks normal and the alarm can go away. And now again, they know exactly what the pressures are in all the cars. No need for a recall at this point. So huge win forward. And it feels to the drivers like the problems just fix themselves. Right? So things just keep going. And that's awesome. Now, eventually, of course, you do have to deal with this. But now they've earned themselves a lot of time. Right? So for example, one of the cars, of course, that had the problem was our Motiva Modus. But Motiva had a lot of information about us and about all their other customers, so they could figure out the best place to actually address that problem instead of issuing a mass recall because they can't distinguish one consumer from the other. So Motiva has pulled together all the understanding of our destination, where we want to actually be at certain times and so on, and offers an experience that's customized to us. Let's actually see how it works. Hey, Motiva, what's up? Hello. We wanted to let you know that we fixed a small mechanical issue with your vehicle. Would you like to hear more? Yeah, I'd love to. We regret that your right rear tire sensors were malfunctioning. We were able to override the problem remotely to monitor your tire pressure. Thanks. That's great news. We did notice a slow leak in that tire. Are you able to pull over in two miles at exit 84? Sure. Why not? We've selected a meeting point and can have a replacement vehicle meet you there. We regret the inconvenience and would like to upgrade you to a stylish 2026 yes. Modus SE. All right. That's great. I'm really excited. That is exactly the model that I've wanted. This sounds like a great idea. Yep. Let's go for it. Great. In the meantime, we recommend avoiding potholes and road debris. Would you like us to drive you there or update your GPS system? Go ahead. Release the wheel anytime. We'll be at the destination in three minutes. Thank you for being a Motiva customer. OK, that's awesome. That is my bar of service, right? That's exactly what we want, right? So a couple of minutes later, our car automatically pulls up. We just have to swap to our brand new Motiva Modus, move our luggage over there, and we're set, right? And we can just keep going. So as far as I'm concerned, somehow Motiva always manages to do it. And that's what we call connected service in 2025. So what have we learned out of this? I think there's a few lessons. When you encounter a bump in the road, so to speak, the first one is the entire company, the engineers, the salespeople, everybody is in the service of the customer. And you have to invest in order to make that happen. It doesn't just work on its own. It doesn't work just from posters. The second one is that it's data and connectivity that help you identify the issues and allow you to actually proactively solve them before they become real problems for the customer. And the third is that problems will fix themselves is the new bar of service. That's the definition of, of best service. Things just always somehow seem to work. OK, so we're back on track. And now that we're driving along in a guaranteed way, we want to figure out how do we actually make a great plan for the weekend? And what happens if we have to make a change in that plan? OK, so we're driving on that road. And we somehow know that this plan is going to work out. But we have to ask ourselves, how did we actually even plan this weekend? Remember, we only had a few days notice. And somehow, we've got this amazing plan. And the answer to that is the following. We actually brought along more than just the three of us. I should have introduced, by the way. Um, I don't remember if it came up, but it's me and my wife and our daughter, Mia. Um, and if you haven't met them already, you will in just a moment. So back in 2019, we all had bots, right? We had these personal assistants. We had Siri and Alexa and Google Assistant. And nobody actually asked, on whose behalf are these assistants working? Right? We were amazed that they were working at all. But by 2025, those assistants are working for us. And we have our own assistants. And one of the most important ones for our family is called Ada. So Ada is this amazing personal assistant that's not, always, not only working on our behalf, but it's always available, right? Obviously, it's in the cloud, but it's kind of traveling with us everywhere. And that digital assistant is constantly stitching together all the information that we need to make sure that we are served um, in whatever ways make sense for us. Let's look at this particular trip. So how is it that Ada managed to actually plan out our vacation? 
Our mission was very simple. We want to spend time together, preferably by the ocean, uh, and have a great uh, time as a family. We only realized it a few days ago. So Ada managed to pull it together because Ada really understood our preferences. In fact, we each have our own Ada that manages to pull together our preferences and ended up coming up with sunny destination, quality family time, relaxation and adventure as the things that we were trying to get. And the way that it did it was it harnessed, of course, those, um, those preferences and connected them with all of the applications that we use regularly and applications that we might want to use. So all of these companies have provided APIs and Ada went across those APIs, figured out our preferences automatically, and then was able to use those APIs to create various scenarios and find one that matched our preferences. By the way, these companies expose these APIs not for ADA. They just expose them because by 2025, if you don't have an API, it's like you didn't have a web page back in 99. You simply don't exist. So if you don't have an API by 2025, ADA doesn't have any way to attach to you. And as far as it's concerned, it's never going to make those recommendations. So ADA's accessing all of this. And let's actually take a closer look at how she stitches these plans together. So here's an example of the small application network, if you like, that uh, we operate inside. And you see all these areas that are important to us. One of the examples is around music. So in 2025, we love music. Right? We love music even in 2019. And we like movies, and we like videos, and we like Marco Polos, and TikToks, and ASMRs, and all sorts of crazy things that you might actually have to go out and, and Google to find out. But Ada doesn't have to be worried about all of those, because Ada has a Mule API in front of them that it uses to actually abstract that out. So here's an example of that. Ada has an entertainment API, and that goes across all of our providers, Spotify, BBC Radio. Here's their API specs in the various formats. Now let's zoom out and actually see that application network in motion. On the right here, you're actually going to see the data that's being exchanged around those applications. And on the left is which applications are talking to each other. So for example, for entertainment, right? Our entertainment is driven by our kid. I don't know how you are, but our kid actually drives our entire entertainment suite. So our, ADA, our kid's ADA, actually, Mia's ADA, goes out and gets data around the recommended artists and suits them for this road trip. What about for financial information, right? My wife actually drives that. And so you see here some recommendations from her financial advisor, another robo-advisor, that comes back with a desired budget for the trip. If you look at lodging, that's more my area. So it looks around and says, what are the various offers that are available during that time that we want to travel? Right? And if for our family, you need also uh, weather, because we like to do a lot of things outdoors. And so you get the wind conditions and the water conditions and all those good things to weave together a plan that actually makes sense so we don't get rained out. How about for mobility? Well, you'd think Motiva is enough. If there's enough traffic, we're going to hop a flight on one of the airlines and actually just hoof it back, right? Because Motiva will take care of that. And that's how, in the end, we ended up with this incredible trip, right? And wouldn't it have been nice in 2019 if it just worked that way? By 2025, it does. OK, so that's the trip. Everything looks great. The reality is it won't be this trip that actually happens because stuff's going to go wrong. OK, so Ada is on top of it. Remember, we're driving down the road, right? We're hoping to actually make this trip. But Ada's in the car with us. And Ada's sensing that things aren't exactly going right. One of the ways that she senses it is she actually observes us. She looks at our facial expressions. She measures the tone in our voices. She's picked up this skill called the centimeter. The centimeter measures sentiment. And I've got a working centimeter over here, so I just wanted to show you that a little bit. All right, so here's the centimeter. What are we seeing here? So we're seeing my wife, our daughter Mia, and myself. I'm the only one on stage right now. And in here, you're seeing the actual sentiment that's being uh, picked up from the facial recognition, from the reconstruction of my face. It's able to guess at the various moods that I'm going through. And underneath that, you're seeing the plot of those sentiments. So in red is my wife, in yellow is Mia, in blue is me, and combined, the family sentiment is in green, and you see it plotted over time. So if I'm happy, it says that I'm happy. That's good. If I'm amazed, like I'm amazed this is working, it should show that I'm amazed. And if I'm angry, it should show I'm angry. But I can't be angry at her for very long, because you'll see she's very sensitive. You'll understand why in a second. 
Now, while I'm doing this, Ada is also scanning around for traffic. So look at the traffic data that's coming in. And Ada is able to see that not only traffic is not so good, but it's actually getting worse and worse, which might explain why I'm getting angry. So in the back of her bot mind, she's starting to say, you know, mood's not so good, traffic is getting worse, it's a very short weekend, maybe I should start to look for alternatives. And so she starts to actually scan the marketplace of alternatives that we're driving through and driving into to start to say, hey, are there any better offers that I might start to explore? Now, before we explore those, though, let's go back into the car. And let's actually trigger her to go from a, hmm, I'm kind of getting worried, to actually take action. Now, to do that, remember I said she's pretty sensitive. I have to scowl at her, OK? So bear with me. Don't make me laugh. I got to get angry here. Hold on. Angry? Angry? There we go. All right. We triggered her. So she went into proactive mode, and she's actually going to go into that marketplace and figure out what other alternatives can I actually make for, this, for my family here. OK. So to do that, let's go and look at the marketplace again. Marketplace, there we go. OK, so what is this marketplace? Now, just think about it, right? It makes a ton of sense. We're driving through lots and lots of hotels and restaurants and amusement parks and beaches and so on. And so there must be other alternatives, right? And I don't know, when I'm driving around, I'm saying to myself, you know, I wish I would have done something different. And my wife seems to have 20-20 hindsight. And um, all of this stuff is now automated. And so this is a real-time marketplace of other opportunities. And let's see what Ada does inside of this. So let's actually try to understand how this marketplace works. Here's the overall architecture. Ada, of course, just talks to an API. Ada says, hey, here's my family. Here's their preferences. Here's their budget. What can you do for me? And all of these businesses that are operating have also exposed APIs. And they accept data in very different ways. So depending on which marketplace you're in, it might be the open inquiry format. It might be the hospitality alliance. Everybody thinks they're a standard. Where have we heard that before? So, Mule is supposed to go across these. And let's actually look at what that API is that Ada has when it's talking to Mule. So basically, in this API, in the middle here, you see a resource, Hospitality Inquiry. And Ada needs to simply post to that a description of all of our preferences. So you see a post here, a body of type Hospitality Inquiry. And the responses are one of the various types. Why does, is, is there any kind of response? This is, after all, an asynchronous API, right? This is a real-time marketplace, so you need to post an inquiry, and then something will end up happening. You're not going to wait for that response. The reason that's the case is because she has to submit different formats. And in order for us to see the format she submitted, we just happen to return it in the body of the response, right? But it's really a 202 accepted. So if we actually look at the, at the modeling. Actually, I'm going to go back one and explain one other thing. If I can go back one, and one forward, and one more forward. OK. I'm going to explain one more thing on this. And that is that I need to understand how the hospitality inquiry is related to these three different formats that I need to submit. And I could have done just a data weave mapping between all of these. But there's a better way, actually, to model the data across all of these. So let me explain, right? We're all talking about hospitality. The fact that there's different combinations shouldn't matter. So I want to actually model the atomic pieces of the data. And I do that through this library. So this library basically says that any hospitality piece of data or any hospitality API will always consist of the following atoms, location information, people information, transportation information, and so on. And then the various formats are just combinations of these. So if I look at hospitality inquiry, it's just a union of all of these pieces of data. And the various marketplaces I can see now are just subsets of that data. Right? That's a good way to actually model something that's going to be really long-lived using RAML data types specifically. OK. So now that I've understood how the model works, Mule is going to do a couple of other things. We know it exposes a web API. It also, since it's acting on our behalf, it should tokenize the sensitive data. And later, when the data comes back, it should detokenize that data so that the marketplace doesn't violate our privacy by seeing too much information. 
Second thing is that this is a real-time marketplace. So it works on publish subscribe. So Mule also mediates that and publishes the information into, in particular, a Kafka topic. We're using Heroku's Kafka as a service. So this is a Kafka topic that is listening for events of type inquiry. And the marketplace players will come back with different offers that our ADAs can take or not take. Now, let's look at that very first Mule, OK? If you open it up, there's a web API at the front. But what's really important is that there's another API in the back. I know it's PubSub. I know it's not request response. It's not a web API. It's an evented API. And in 2019, MuleSoft really pushed the idea of recognizing evented interactions, evented architectures as APIs and productizing them and getting all the advantages that we got from web APIs in these kinds of APIs. We publish your events in a portal and you'd apply policies to them, you design them intentionally and so on and so forth. So in particular, we supported a standard called async API. Here's an example of an async API spec. And it will look very similar to you, except it's got publish and subscribe instead of the normal REST methods to that. And if you go even in 2019 and you look at async API, you'll find this spec. It's an open spec. Highly encourage you to go and, and play with it. And one of the things that it allows you to do is to share data types with web APIs. So here, for example, is the RAML spec for the web part. Here's the async API for the evented API. Both of them share the data types that we saw modeled together. So now you can completely reconcile the data no matter what kind of API is happening all across your application network. Very powerful stuff. OK. Once I have the APIs defined, it's very easy to actually implement the Mule. I know the inputs and the outputs. And so here you can see that I've got API kit on the front. I'm logging the incoming request. I do the router. I transform. I publish the message, and so on and so forth. Okay, So very simple to go ahead and implement that Mule. And now let's play with that API. So let's go ahead and submit through ADA to that API. I'm going to actually post something. And you see, in fact, I'm going to choose the, the actual implementation, the one that's Mule. And here's the information that I put inside. So that's all the information that ADA submits to this API, all our private information. When you actually click Send, you get a 202 accepted. So the marketplace has accepted the message. And all the data has actually been tokenized. right? So all the sensitive stuff is out. The marketplace doesn't care about it. We'll be able to fix it later. And there is no other response. It's an event at API. Right? Nothing has actually happened yet. OK, let's take a look at that inside our visualizer. So we're going to have ADA submit the information. Mule is going to publish that to the evented API of the inquiries. And we see the data on the right. So if we expand that and we look at actually what went in, what we see is those tokens that we saw before. Right? So that's the data that the marketplace actually received. Now, remember, this is a marketplace. So there's other families driving around. Otherwise, it would be just our own private marketplace. It wouldn't have enough liquidity. So the other families that are driving around at the same time are doing the same kind of thing. They're publishing their inquiries. And the subscribers are receiving a whole bunch of inquiries in real time. And that allows them to start to actually mix and match and negotiate across these things. So let's see how that works. When they've put all of those um, inquiries together, they've created offers. And they send those offers back up to our ADA, to the other ADAs. And the negotiation actually starts. And we'll actually see details of that negotiation in, in just a moment. Now remember, this is a real-time marketplace. So it happens really fast, right? This isn't people getting on the phone and calling each other. These are machines negotiating with each other. So if you're going to operate a marketplace like that, you have to think about it more like a stock market, right? And you have to really put operational analytics. Here, I'm going into Cloud Hub. I'm showing you the actual data that came in on the other side. It's detokenized now. Now, that's just one interaction. Imagine you've got millions and millions of those every hour. And so we have to look at the operational characteristics of this. And this is where your investment in operational excellence and monitoring really, really pays off. Because you have to keep these going very, very fast. Okay. Now, that's interesting. right? Operationally, it's really important to get this going. It's an even bigger aha moment when you think about what actual negotiation looks like. So let's take a look inside of the negotiation, inside this marketplace. So we saw before that we submitted an inquiry of this type with these parameters. We like activities and so on. The other family did the same thing. 
And the three providers came back with offers for the three of us. We saw those three offers before, right? All of them are offering some kind of accommodation and some level of activities and so on. The other family looked at this and said, you know what, we like that one so much, we just like to stay an extra day. So this provider said, fine, I'll give you an extra day at exactly the same price. That's the very short negotiation that happened there. Our Ada, not so easy to please. She said, these are good offers, they're not good enough. I want a lower price, I want more activities. And so the two providers responded back, and one of them managed to add a lot of activities, but up the price. The other one kept the price constant, threw in a few extra things. Our Ada, well, the other Ada, by the way, accepted this completely. Our Ada said, no, nah, I actually want the one with more activities at the same price as the lower price one. Can you get that to me? And the provider said, you know what? I'll get that to you if you accept in five minutes. Sound familiar? We've just automated that. So it's saying, fine, I'll give you five minutes to go ahead and accept that. And so Ada said, fine, I'll take your challenge, and I got five minutes to sell it to my family in order to accept this thing. And now she's got all of the information to actually sell it to us. So now she does this incredible pitch job with, look at what you could be doing instead of being stuck in traffic, right? You could be sitting there on the beach and surfing at this incredible hotel, and we're like, wait, that's a no-brainer, right? It's pretty obvious now that she stitched all this stuff together. She gave me a much better offer. Of course I'm going to take it. And as far as I'm concerned, Ada's saved the day one more time. And that's how these problems just seem to melt in the air. So, what did we learn? First, it's the bots that need to connect the dots. You don't need this swivel chair human integration in order to figure all of that stuff out as long as the APIs are actually exposed. The second is that the bots need to negotiate on your behalf, right? It doesn't make sense if one of those bots were actually owned by one of those providers. So we'll get to a point where it's bots negotiating against, around bots, and all of our marketplaces will become a lot more dynamic. And finally, for those of us who are old enough to remember the Palm Pilot, we finally have working personal digital assistants that actually are assisting us in getting our stuff done. 30 years later, but hey, eventually we got there. Okay, so now we've got our plan. Nothing could possibly go wrong, right? Well, as it turns out, some of this stuff you can't make up. So we're sitting there at our resort, right, having a lot of fun. And even though we've put an API on pretty much everything, we still don't have the internet of marine life. So our daughter steps right on a sea urchin. Now, our alarm goes off, her alarm goes off, her watch goes off, various things go off. You don't need any of that. You just listen to her screaming. It's pretty clear something went drastically wrong. I run into the ocean, pick her up, take her over to the hotel room. Now I'm a little bit worried because I know she's got a shellfish allergy. And this is kind of a shellfish, not quite sure. So I don't know what to do about this, but I'm pretty uh, intensely interested in what is the right thing to do at this point. Now, in 2019, you guys might have gone to Google. In 2025, of course, we ask Ada, Ada, what should we do about this? And here's what she says. I recommend a benevolent guide to help you through this medical concern, or I can call 911 if it's an emergency. Hmm. Which would you prefer? Let's go with the Benevolo guide. What is this thing called Benevolo? Let me introduce you to a new service model for healthcare. Benevolo is not some fancy medicine. It's healthcare that actually puts the patient at the center of everything that it's doing. And it's giving you effectively a concierge experience no matter what has actually happened to you, and it's available anytime. And the way that it does it is it doesn't replace humans with bots. It actually empowers humans that it calls Benevolo Guides with all the information they need to get you great service whenever it is that you, that you want to do that. Let me show you actually how that works. So Ada realized that she is no medical assistant. She's no medical genius. She's got a lot of information about us, but she needs to hand over control to someone who actually knows what they're doing. And that's where Benevolo comes in. Benevolo takes this data, adds medical information, and adds a whole host of skills around um, medical care and what happens uh, in urgent situations and so on. So that's the role of Benevolos, to take that and wrap it together into an experience and put that in front of these Benevolo guides so they can do the right thing. So 
Here's our virtual guide, Julie. She's, she's actually a real person. But all of this data has been assembled from Ada through Benevolo, along with medical data. And also, Julie has been trained at the thing that humans are really good at, right? Which is empathy and soft skills and so on. And she's trained on a lot of case data, which was collected through Benevolo in the past and through Ada in the past. So Julie, as the virtual guide, teleports into our room. What does that mean? She just appears on the screen inside of our hotel room, right? But that's good enough. So here she is. She matches us, Ada, uh, sorry, Benevolo matches us with uh, Julie. And Julie appears. And Julie is a very calming voice, but Julie is, comes armed with data. Julie understands that, she, that we need all of these items. And she says, hey, get all of this stuff ready. And Julie helps us to actually remove the spikes. I'm going to spare you that part of the demo. Not very exciting. How is it that Julie manages to just solve the problem? Well, here's the information Benevolo puts in front of her, collected from all of these systems. Right? It's a whole dashboard of stuff that's customized for the immediate case at hand, so Julie doesn't have to collect any information. If you look on the left, it's not only the exact medical information, is who's our providers, who's our insurance, and so on. It's also the knowledge that we've got a teenager on our hands, and magically, for any teenager, if you have any teenagers, you just put on the right music, and the mood changes completely. So she knows exactly what to do. Remember, we already had that subscription uh, through Ada. The next thing is you look at all of the insurance information, but not only do you see the insurance information, you're also able to say, you know what, the right thing to do for the patient is to forget and ask, forget this particular policy, ask for an exception. We call her Julie the, the, um, the bureaucracy slayer, right? Because she's able to just punch through all of those. She's got APIs to the insurance providers, and she just can punch right through those things. She can also connect us with allergists who know exactly what could be going on. She connects us, in fact, to the local area of urgent care facilities so we can get Mia over to a doctor and check out exactly what's going on. Sounds great, right? But there's a problem. Remember, we had terrible traffic. That's what led us to here. So how are we even going to get to that urgent care center quickly? Well, remember, Julie is a bureaucracy slayer. It turns out she can slay more than just that because we are actually in a place called Ocean City, and Ocean City is a smart city. So Ocean City puts its infrastructure behind APIs at the service of not only its residents, but also the visitors. So Ocean City, in fact, advertises that. That's why people go to Ocean City. It's like, if you come here, we'll get you to your destination. We'll help you park. If you've got an emergency, you know, we'll deal with it. So it advertises this as actually part of its value. How does this actually work? Of course, it's built on API-led layers. So if you look at this eye chart, and you don't try to grok the whole thing. But if you look at the lower left, you'll see that it took several of its systems, for example, the traffic control systems, traffic lights, and put APIs on top of that, and put process APIs, like route planning, on top of that. And usually, it exposes it just to emergency services, but actually, it's available to services like Benevolo as well. So let's look at that API. That API is a priority routing API. And what it does is if you've got a priority routing request and you have a good reason, you can submit that. So here you can say, I've got a personal medical emergency, and I need to get from that place to that place. And the urgency is medium in this case. OK, so what should happen when we actually submit a request here? So let's go and hit send. What you get back is a thank you. That's it. It's a 201 created. It's another event at API. Right? I'm not able right now to give it to you. But I've received your request. What does the city do if it accepts this request? Does it just send an API to a traffic light and turn it green? That'd be a pretty big disaster, because what about the cross traffic, right? So you never actually put an API on top of a traffic light. You actually put it on a whole intersection and let the intersection manage the traffic inside. So what does an intersection API actually look like? Let's look at that. Here's the intersection control API. And for this one, you basically say, I want the north-south traffic in six seconds to turn green and let the intersection make that happen. So let's see what happens when we hit Submit to that one. We get, thank you. That's it. And I'm going to make that happen whenever the traffic is actually managed. So that's not a very satisfying demo. Let's actually look at what happens when we program the city. So let's actually look at a simulation of traffic lights. Couldn't actually do this on real traffic lights. Here is the route. That, um, that Benevolo found for us. Now, in 2019, this route is optimized for traffic. In 2025, the traffic optimizes for the situation. So if we zoom in on this route and we look at a particular intersection, it's not that interesting 
But if you zoom again, once you put APIs on top of it, you'll see that when we send in a request to that to say, turn green, one of them turns red. And by the time it's turned red, then the other one can go ahead and turn green. OK. And so if we now zoom out and we look at six of these intersections at once, and we start to send traffic. So at the beginning, it's, they're just doing their normal traffic light thing. And now we start to actually hit them with APIs. And let's see what happens. So this one is going to turn green in this direction. This one's already green. The third one is going to turn green. The fourth one is going to turn green. And the fifth one, green as well. OK, so that's how you generate a wave, right? You send in these APIs in a synchronized manner, and you get your traffic going to where you want to. Now, that's really cool. What does it actually look like in real life as viewed through the Motiva modus that's driving us around? Let's go take a look. So here's an actual simulation of what it looks like from the Motiva modus. And you see we're coming up to an intersection. Light's going to turn green kind of at the last moment. We get to the next one. We need to clear out this car. So it turns green a little bit early, gets rid of that one. We get to the third intersection. No big surprise, I hope. Turns green. We get to the next one. Now, is, do we need to preload this thing? No, this car is going to get out of its way on its own, so we can do it at the last moment. This last one has turned green, and you can tell the pattern. This is what a green wave looks like. I wish I had that back in 2019, but hey, we have to wait a few more years to get there. Fortunately, you'll be happy to know, after we made it to the clinic, Mia was fine, made it to the hotel, no more issues, largely because it's really time to wrap up this demo. So what have we learned? There's interesting things. And in this case, I want to say, what have we learned about this entire uh, demo of what the future of service is like? I think there's three big things that we can take away from this. The first is one of mindset. So as it turns out, behind the scenes, Motiva actually didn't start out as some kind of connected car company. It was actually a joint venture of a lot of car companies. And it's set to change the mindset of, uh, of the engineers that worked for it by doing design-led thinking. So the first thing is to actually think, what would be the incredible experience we want to provide to our customers? Start from that. No matter how difficult it might seem, start from that. Right? Think of it as an API-led. Right? Put down the high bar. and then. Validate it by mocking it. How do you do that? With people running around and getting on the phones and doing all that hard work that you know won't scale just in order to validate it. Right? If you like, that's the mocking of that experience. And once you know that's the right thing, then you invest in the right systems. Make sure those engineers are empowered. Make sure that everybody has the ability to actually act on those things by the time that they scale it out. And then you incentivize. Because if you don't reward people for the right behavior, guess what? They won't do it for a long time. Nobody acts altruistically. You actually have to put incentives where they actually meet the company objectives. Now, that's the first lesson, is how do you actually turn mindset and operationalize it? Second is, you can't actually predict the future, right? I can't do it on this stage. I don't know that this is exactly how it will work out. And neither could ADA. ADA actually came out of something interesting. They were just a simple travel planning company. But they said, you know, wouldn't the future be much better if this happened? And so they set themselves up, but they couldn't bet the farm. They couldn't say, we're going to drop all of our existing business and just go into the future. So they started to experiment. And the way that they did this is they put APIs on everything, and they started to do little pieces. So they said, for example, let's just add a couple more capabilities. Let's add a music service, and let's add a banking service, and see if our customers will benefit from customized road trip music and from customized financial services to budget out for those trips. And when those worked, then they leaned into that more and more. Right? So they took it incrementally by taking this API-led approach. And eventually, because this network effect kept going, ADA turned into this powerhouse of intelligent assistance. But they didn't actually start from there. So that's a way to become future-proof. The third one is rethinking what it means to collaborate, both inside your company and with your partners. So if you look at where Benevolo came from, Benevolo actually was just operating a whole set of uh, very low-cost local clinics. And they said, you know, we can continue to do that probably forever, but we think healthcare is going to go in a different place. And so they needed to bring in some different capabilities. Mark, in fact, will talk about a T-shaped organization tomorrow morning. They realized that they needed to bring in T-shaped individuals, experts in different domains that could collaborate with each other. And so they had the health system experts, and they brought in some consumer data 
experts that could actually understand how to engage with consumers. And they brought in API experts that realized how do we actually create an API ecosystem like you've heard here today, like you'll hear more tomorrow, and put all of these capabilities together and realize that often the collaboration is going to happen not in real time. It's because somebody exposed something and somebody else consumed it and so on. And then they rewarded that collaborative behavior. So they said, for example, hey, if you reuse an external service instead of building one here, we'll actually incentivize you, right? We'll actually give you more budget the next year. So they rewarded that behavior and they turned it into, they ran API programs and so on, and turned it into the normal muscle motion of this company until it became both the operator of some clinics, but also the operator of a platform for a lot of other clinics. And that's how they ended up in this uh, healthcare assistant. So that's the actual collaboration that's going on, right? It's going uh, across these systems. There's an interesting pattern, though, here that is really hard for a lot of you in the room. Ada didn't own the entire consumer experience. It handed it over to Benevolo. Benevolo didn't own the entire service. It handed it over to the city. And remember, Motiva handed over a lot of stuff to Ada. No one company will own the customer by 2025. If you look it up, it's, we're evolving into something called a coherence economy. It's a new economy where these various players cohere together for a customer without one company ever owning everything. And that's one of the hardest mindsets to change, and that's something that I, I would urge you to take a look at, focusing on the customer outcome and not on ownership. Okay, all this, of course, brought to you by the power of application networks. And I wanted to thank these incredible uh, people and organizations that helped me put this together. This whole thing came together in about a couple of months uh, at the beginning of this year. So if I could do it in a couple of months, maybe it's not that impossible. Um, and not only do I want to thank these people, but I want to leave you with one last thought, which is what are you doing today in 2019 to become one of these amazing companies by 2025? Thank you very much. Thank you.